PAX attendees, please welcome to the stage our Storytime keynote speaker, Matthew Mercer. Hi, everyone. Holy shit. <laughs> hey. Whew. My goodness. I have a limited time to talk, <laughs> which is probably for the best, I think. Um, so, hello there, everybody. Uh, why the hell am I here? Well, my name is Matthew Mercer. I am a voice actor in cartoons and video games. Some examples of some of the characters that I voice for those who aren't aware. Um, but I'm also a dungeon master for a bunch of other nerdy ass voice actors <laughs> on a show called Critical Role. Um, these people are the dearest people in my life outside of my family, and even that's kind of rivaling quickly. <laughs> Mom and dad gotta really step it up this past next year. Um, but as part of this presentation, I've never done a speaking scenario like this, talk about myself on stage. It's my least favorite thing in the world is to talk about myself in front of people. So I'm here. <laughs> I'm sleep deprived and it's gonna get weird. <laughs> um, but I'm thankful to be here and I'm here because of these wonderful people, these individuals I've had the opportunity to collaborate, create with. And as part of the theme of building this out, I also asked all of them to engage in a trust exercise with me. Uh, there are certain slides in this presentation where I left them blank and asked them each to choose an image <laughs> to send to my wife Marisha and yesterday she snuck them in without me seeing them. So as they arise, <laughs> hopefully they'll fit the theme. Um, <laughs> but anyway, once again, why am I here? I love games and tabletop RPGs. Uh, these games made me who I am today. Uh, they brought me my found family, not just the people you just saw on the screen, but I mean, to an extension, you folks here, like this is my community. And uh, they, I genuinely believe they've taught me to be a better person. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to think I'm not the only one here that feels the same way about your experience here. So. This event kind of really is a culmination of what that community means. I've been going to conventions since I was extremely young, and they've been a, a part of my pretty much entire formative life. And this event is a celebration of passion in games and passion in community and sharing and creating stories and experiences together, collaboratively, competitively, challenging each other to be better, that is what this is about. And I'm so glad and so proud and so honored to be your Storytime speaker at this event. So thank you for having me. Um, so, as part of this presentation, let's embarrassingly follow my journey. <laughs> and hopefully some of it will resonate with yours. Uh, little asterisks on that. Uh, I've never made a PowerPoint before. Uh, I've <laughs> learned how to do this for this, and uh, part of the inspiration for this was finding a bunch of old photos and art from my childhood as of late and figured, why not? If I'm gonna be here, let me embarrass myself thoroughly in public. Um, so, that all being said. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be like this, okay. Let's begin with origins and inspirations. <laughs> Everyone comes from somewhere, even small tortoises <laughs> have to have some origin story. And like these two lovebirds, one that seems far more into it than the other, uh, I started somewhere as a little baby. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say most of you did too. And if not, I wanna hear that story. That's gonna be real interesting. Um, but as I grew up 
even in my young ears, there were certain things that come into your life that change the trajectory of what excites you. For me, it really began with a Nintendo. <laughs> this was an experience that completely consumed me to a frustrating degree for teachers, my parents, to uh, many other people I'm sure in my life still to this day. Uh, but this, this love affair with gaming really kind of enthralled me and, and, and brought a new form of interactive storytelling that I had no idea existed before. Uh, two formative games at the time that really changed that for me. On top of that were Dragon Warrior and the first Final Fantasy game, which in hindsight I look back and like, oh, they had spell slots. There's a lot of those actual like, mind flayers in there. I wonder where they got their inspiration. But nevertheless, these games consumed me at the time and really kind of uh, set the path for a lot of my life to go forward. Um, of course, when you're young and you find points of inspiration, you also get creative. Uh, and so I've had the pleasant experience of going through some of my old drawings, which I get to share with you today. Uh, starting with this wonderful drawing of... What I assume to be Egon Spangler from the real Ghostbusters, based on the hair flip, uh, just slaughtering... <laughs> bloody the Stay Puft, but thankfully he's been disarmed of his massive Glock uh, by what looks like a flying tricycle. Uh, so inspiration starts in strange places, nevertheless, but as it progressed, you know, the Nintendo reference and Nintendo inspiration definitely continued. You could see this early, you know, interpretation of Bowser. I even got the axe on the battlefield. I wanted to be accurate at that age. Um, but my Mario drawings got better with time, eventually upgrading to one of the greatest games of the NES era, um, this also works as a great mood board. Uh, I'm Peach right now, if you can't tell from the expression <laughs> that Deer in the Headlights uh, presentation. Um, and so eventually my Sonic the Hedgehog era, the Genesis upgrade was amazing to me. Uh, I also had a unique sense of humor as the years go on that you begin to figure out the strange... <laughs> and sometimes darker facets of my early artwork. <laughs> A lot of those parent-teacher discussions are making a lot more sense in hindsight. Um, but nevertheless, art was a big part of my life growing up. I loved to draw. I did it all the time in class, out of class. But of all the things I drew, the continuous theme was monsters, creatures, demons, dragons, odd beasts. You can see I was in my McFarland Liefeld era on that one by the lack of understanding of musculature. Um, <laughs> But this was everything that I drew, pretty much, uh, all through art school and high school. And uh, one person that picked it up at a young age was this woman. This is my granny. Uh, she passed when I was about 10, but in the years that we had together when I was young, she was the cool granny, this, this wonderful woman that lived off in the mountains of Georgia, just outside of Helen, uh, in a cabin, had a hard life and an even harder marriage, but the escapism she found was through Novels, books, stories, and Nintendo games. We would trade Nintendo games whenever I'd go and visit. Um, but she, at a younger age than my reading level could probably initially get, but it gave me a reason to work towards, introduced me to reading. So when I was eight, these were the first few books she gave me. Um, I'm extremely grateful. And it took a few readings to pick up all the nuances at that age. Um, but these radically uh, expanded my brain even further. Like, on, on top of what the limitations of the era of gaming, this was worlds that I could lose myself in through somebody else's lens. Uh, in hindsight, some of it doesn't hold up quite as well. Here's Anthony. Uh, his interpretation of female empowerment doesn't really hold scrutiny as well these days, but nevertheless, these were formative at that era. Um, and it all eventually led to this. My, my drawings as they progressed, uh, my mother found this at a garage sale. So it's the best play to go when you don't have a lot of money and you need presents for your kids. It's great. Um, and this, she saw it and was like, this is exactly what Matt needs. Didn't have any other books, but I didn't need it. It was just drawings of creatures <laughs> to certain dubious degrees of quality. Um, but the stories that came with them. The, the myths of where, where they exist in the world and how they interact with each other and numbers that I didn't get yet, but it was cool that somebody thought of that. Um, but. <laughs> what
What I was lacking at the time <laughs> was community. Much like Han here, I stood on the outside of other people enjoying <laughs> moments of bonding and connection, and yet I couldn't find a way to get in. <laughs> so being a solitary kid through a lot of my earlier and mid-school years, I was introverted. I just kind of drew to myself on the side. I, um, you know, tried to express what I could to help kids in class, but I had a hard time engaging because I didn't quite know where I belonged and where my interests connected. Um, exactly, I feel you, buddy. <laughs> um, when I got to high school, that changed when I was introduced to the Popular Arts Club in 1996 to 97. Some of you weren't born yet. We're not going to go into that. Um, the Popular Arts Club was the cool presentational way of saying the nerdy anime video game club. We had wonderful invitational images on the outside of the club. Um, and in these you know, moments, we'd get together in the middle of Club Rush and have video game parties and contests, and a lot of them breakdanced. I did not get into that, but they were awesome when they did it. Um, you can see how this is a nice bigger picture of some of the people that ran the club and this weird little nerd right there in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, well, thank you. Uh, some things don't change. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was these people that invited me to my very first session of Dungeons and Dragons. They were the elder classmen, seniors and juniors. I was a freshman in high school and was like, oh my god, that book I had, I can finally play it, I can do this. So I immediately dove in and got a, a hands in a player's handbook and started building out my first character. Emeritus Trent, which is a name I took exactly from Piers Anthony Zant series, because your first character is largely ripped off of things you know. Um, notice here, uh, his family is slain. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to be a parent in a fantasy world, apparently. <laughs> Um, also, uh, second edition D&D, for those who played it and know, I also made the great combination choice of playing a wizard at first level with the militant wizard kit, which means the only benefit you get is your wizard can now swing a sword, because nothing's greater than a first level wizard in second edition D&D in the front lines. Um, but the game wasn't clicking for me. The story wasn't investing me. Uh, it, the, the, while they were great to invite me, their idea of gameplay was less about story and world and, and immersiveness and uh, you know, great heroic charges and more about just messing around and you know, pinching the barmaid and rolling 2d12 barbarians and jump out of a bush. And you're like, okay. So I, I got disinterested in it for a bit. And so my parents, seeing this, surprised me. Oh, yeah. Let me just restart uh, Dungeons and Dragons and I get to write the whole story plot around my little finger. That's why I didn't want you to quit, man. I was like, no. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> no guesswork in this All game. Monstrous Manual. Nice and sleek black color, too. <laughs> Better than the white that everyone else has. It's rough. Is that the right one? Yeah, it's the right one. But the one I have upstairs is the outdated version. Is, uh, I'm already You ready? Oh, okay. Good. So, uh, radically changed the trajectory of my life in a lot of ways that we know now. <laughs> At the time, was just excited to now build my own worlds and craft a, a game experience in the way that I wanted to experience it and give that to the people I cared about. So I invited my friends to join my campaign and we were off to the races. Ran campaign that summer, ran another campaign, and then I began to meet other friends that also were into other games. I realized, oh, there's other systems than D&D. And thus became the summer from the Dungeons Master's Guide to a whole plethora of interesting game experiences. I uh, got to talk to my history teacher, Mr. Busby, about Shadowrun, and he lent me the book as well as the Amber Diceless role-playing game and the accompanying fantasy novel series. It was great. Marvel's Heroes Advanced set. Didn't age well over time, but I loved the hell of it when I was a kid. GURPS is, is a wonderful step in the direction of wild options and choices that culminated with rifts. <laughs> now, Ke Kevin Zambita created the most incredible kitchen sink RPG system for a, a teenage boy in the 90s. It, it was like certain games could focus on genre or we could just 
Genre! <laughs> Anything you want. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a, a giant cyborg with a massive chainsaw sword? Yeah, go for it. You want to be a, an awesome ley line walker who can control magical energies in the spirit of great sagely magicians? Go for it. You want to be a mystical cyber knight that travels around with his laser sword amongst the, the, the planets and the starscape? Go for it. You want to go ahead and be a guy in giant glittery power armor with a real gun on his shoulder? Sure, glitter boyed up. That's great. You want to be whatever... Um, Whatever that is, <laughs> be my guest. You want to be a fucking min-maxer and pull in the Wormwood book and everyone just makes Apox? You know who you are, and I'm judging you. <laughs> Little side note on here. So Rifts was uh, an, inc an incredible game in a lot of ways. Uh, challenging, but not run by the right kind of people. Um, but we got through a bunch of half campaigns. I think my friend Ian tried to make uh, Son Goku from Dragon Ball in there, like way overpowered. My friend Gavin tried to make Solid Snake, which just having SDC weapons meant he was useless. Um, it, it was a lot of fun, but it was a challenge system in some ways. But my friend Todd had all the books, like all of them. And he was convinced, he's like, this is the greatest system in the world because all of this is compatible. And he like challenged us to find a better system. And so we're like, okay, you're saying all this is compatible, right? So yeah, it's the Palladium universe, baby. It's all compatible. We're like, okay. And it's not broken. No. <laughs> well, they did have the Robotech role-playing game in there. We were being anime fans. We're like, oh, they have the Robotech game. They must have the SDF-1, which is this massive city-sized battle cruiser. Now, the thing about Rifts is the numbers got ridiculous when it came to galactic-scale combat. Uh, you'd have weapons on massive cannons that would do 1d4 times 1 million mega damage. And you know, but everything was numerical in value except for one that we found. For the damage on the primary weapon of the SDF-1 had no numerical value. It just absolutely destroys everything in its path of fire. <laughs> Two miles wide, by the way. <laughs> so we made a plan. We hijacked the SDF-1. And then we said, what's another book in the Palladium universe? The Pantheon's book, which had stats for all different pantheons, some that are really problematic looking back on the book. Um, but you could, they had hit point values for Thor and you know, Marduk and like, all these different gods out there with absurd hit point values. You're not supposed to kill them. <laughs> but when your laser destroys absolutely everything in its path, <laughs> I think we wiped out a half the Norse pantheon before. He was like, all right, fine, you win. And we stopped playing. Um, anyway, <laughs> all that being said, finding these communities and these people began to really inspire me. And we began to share our stories through this discovered community. And that, that was a, an amazing thing that transformed my life in ways that even I wasn't preparing at that young age. And that brought me into theater. I, did, I went from this shy kid, and through playing these games and running these games, I began to grow more comfortable with performing these characters and finding weird voices and physicality and all of a sudden I was coming out of my shell in ways I never thought I could. And so I began to do theater in college, and, and, and then I go to college, sadly, um, but in high school and outside of high school in community theater. And uh, also, I was a big fan of anime. Uh, that got heavily into my life and it was through these inspirations that I began to discover other conventions for the first time. Or a convention, Anime Expo. Oh my God, there are people there that are into the same stuff I am. This is, this is amazing. The community swelled even further. Uh, let me preface this. Halloween is a very important thing in my family. <laughs> we went hard on Halloween. Uh, all manner of interesting costumes from a very young age. Uh, the early Legend of Zelda years to my Magus from Chrono Trigger in high school, to even my first Sephiroth, <laughs> to Laguna, Final Fantasy VIII. You can see where a lot of the gaming inspiration continued from there. But Halloween was super important to me. And I went to this convention and people were dressed up in costumes in July. <laughs> I can do this other days of the year? <laughs> this is incredible. And so I began to take this kid, this nerdy high schooler, and started finding a new community by destroying hotel rooms throughout the night. <laughs> in preparation last minute that I didn't prepare for a photo shoot that they brought me into a week before. Um, 
but began to make costumes of some of my favorite characters. This is my Cloud Strife, this is my Sephiroth. Uh, I fell in love with the craft of these, these costumes as another expression of fandom, but I also met so many wonderful people through this. Yeah, I also got some weird stuff too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but there's something about the, the challenge of bringing these characters to life and then finding other people to do the same and get together and just be nerds at a convention together and do photos and like hang out and get caught in a blizzard snowstorm at Katsukon for four days where you can't escape. Um, getting to have like video game tournaments and hotel rooms, like my whole sense of community just exploded. Suddenly I felt that a little alone kid back in the day was not just not very alone but was surrounded by so many people that were passionate in the ways that I was. And that gave me a growing sense of community that I never realized I needed more than anything. And these friends are still some of my favorite friends to this day. <laughs> and like any good friends, if I love them, I'd run a game for them. And that was how they knew I cared. And in those moments, that's where you truly bonded together. Another thing you learn through gaming is preparation. <laughs> Much like how Sonic has to prepare himself by devouring enough calories to get him enough speed to go as fast as he's gotta. <laughs> preparation is a wonderful tool set for many facets of life that running games and playing games teaches you without you even realizing. Now, I'm a big fan of the adage, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And through some of the experiences in my life and my fandoms, I didn't realize how much of this was preparing me for another path in my life. Becoming a dungeon master got me into the arts and also filled this whole spectrum of voices and dialects and accents and character personalities that I could just jump into and inhabit comfortably. And I also liked anime <laughs> and video games. This could possibly lead to something else. And so I thought of this possibility of voiceover being a, a thing I could go into. And I look back now and see how much gaming and the community around me prepared me to embark on this endeavor, to take it seriously and also have a lot of baseline skills that I could hone through training to really take into that space. Because it's intimidating. And this is my first day on my very first big prelay animation project, my first day of recording for the 2011 Thundercats where I voiced Tigra. Wonderful show, didn't get as long a run as it deserved. Um, but I walked into this room with titans of the industry. Uh, Kevin Michael Richardson, who is one of the most incredible voice actors in the industry. You look him up and you're like, oh, he's been in everything. Uh, Will Friedle, who is Lino in the series. Uh, it is being directed by Andre Romano, who is one of the most prominent voice directors in history. She directed Animaniac, she directed Batman the Animated Series. Uh, she, she is incredible, and I was so nervous in the first few sessions that I found out later on, they almost recast me in that. But in taking it seriously and falling back on kind of that training and once the comfort got in there and the sense of community that the other actors provided by about the fourth recording session, you're like, oh, there he is. Went back and we recorded those sessions and it worked out great. But a lot of these skills all just came from gaming and the people around me, both in theater and at my table rolling dice. Uh, here's Will Friedle there in the recording booth. I remember him joshing me a little bit about uh, role-playing games, and I invited him to play D&D, &D, and he's like, I never played D&D, maybe one day. But I did find out he's a huge advocate for fantasy and fantasy novels, and so we bonded heavily over that. And as the years go on, we became very, very close friends, and I adore him immensely. Um, and he's but one of many, many people that, that, those weird little skills that I learned through gaming ended up bringing me the community that is now the most important thing in my life. Now, whether you're a GM or a player, you never know what the other will throw at you. So you prepare where you can. Otherwise, you have to learn about adaptability. <laughs> Sometimes life takes you on a fun journey with an abrupt stop and you have to learn to pivot, twist, and land softly. <laughs> or at least have a friend nearby to hear your cries to take you to the hospital. <laughs> One of the things that gaming teaches us, and many of you know, is how to adapt on the fly. Whether that be uh, crafting a story at the table with your friends and making choices, uh, combat 
and tactics is a big thing about learning to adapt. Having to have a plan going in, and once that plan begins to fail or change, how to throw it out the window and come up with something else on the fly, whether it be by yourself, like in the cases of wargaming, uh, which I got heavily into uh, Fantasy Warhammer in high school, had a break for a while, then got heavily into War Machine. This was actually my Menoth army that I painted back in the day. Uh, me and Marisha played this extensively uh, in the earlier days of our relationship. And let me tell you, there's nothing more bonding than you and your significant other uh, angrily beating each other at a war <laughs> game and arguing over rules. Um, but these, this is another classic example of, of tabletop gaming teaching you how to change things on the fly, how to think tactically, but also be willing to shift on a moment's notice. Um, some games might be a little more intricate than what I'm used to. Uh, <laughs> but those of you that can, there, there is incredibly uh, important things to learn from these extensive gaming experiences. Uh, in our house, we have a spectrum. Uh, we adore things like the sweet, cozy experience of the Stardew Valley game and the dark, nightmarish experience of Kingdom Death Monster. Um, all of these offer many different kinds of uh, tactical, adaptive experiences that help us when what life just throws stuff at you, when people throw things at you, and you just kind of learn to bend with it, you know, uh, much like the Mohadib. Um, and also teach you the right people that can adapt on your back if you go into a Nerf war. <laughs> now, the, <laughs> another important factor that gaming has taught me is collaboration. For when you're all alone, you end up looking around yourself with no one to grasp, <laughs> no one to hold on to as they rush away and you're left dribbling and spinning with no mooring to hold you still. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> but through collaboration, you really can find ways to do something together that is incredible and larger than the sum of what one person can do. These dice have told so many stories for so many people and have really taught me that my favorite experiences are the ones that I make with others. Um, through the years, it has definitely been a love language to the people I care about. These are the minis I painted for the campaign before Vox Machina, there, uh, where I met Luis Carrazzo, who some of you may know from some of the stuff on, on, online. Um, you know, there's me running our game there on the lower left with that early group where I was code DMing, which was fun. I've also run games at Meltdown for newcomers and friends. It's, it's just how I show my love to people that I care about or people that I know would enjoy this experience and I want to get to know better. Because there's no faster way to find out if a person can really engage with you as a friend and even as a collaborator in the future than to have them sit at a table and roll some dice, whether it be board gamings or tabletop role-playing games. It's also a breeding ground for mutual inspiration by meeting other creators in the space. This is Mark Hume. Some of you may recognize him from High Rollers, a wonderful British DM. Uh, I've known him for 15 years, met him through cosplay at Anime Expo. Um, that's him holding the original Pike Mini when we were still playing at home. Uh, this is before we even started streaming. I've known Mark for so long. We would go to conventions together. We would... <laughs> Whenever he would come to LA, he'd stay with me and I'd run games for him. Whenever I'd go to the UK, he'd you know, run games for me. This has been a long time uh, pen pal romance. Um, and he also, we get tired after playing a lot. And I have a weird collection of pictures of him passing out in public spaces, <laughs> usually after a long night of drinking, because that's what you do apparently in Britain, is you just drink a lot. Um, nevertheless, it's also, gaming is a shortcut to forging bonds with like-minded creators. I began to find people through my games and through the shining community to make things uh, in media. I began to direct web series, like There'll Be Brawl. I directed this noir crime drama version of the Smash Brothers universe in like 2009, uh, where I actually technically first played Ganondorf. Uh, <laughs> uh, as well as directing a, a comedy kind of uh, John Hughes high school version of the Game of Thrones universe. Uh, and these are all just people that I met either through extended community or gaming and then brought them in through games to become closer friends, and many of them are still some of my best friends to this day. Uh, these people here uh, have, through the experience of voiceover in the industry, become the strongest collaborators in my life. Um, and it's all because they went on a whim for this dude. They met in a couple of projects they worked together who was like, hey, you want to be nerdy and roll some dice? And they went, yeah, okay. <laughs> Except for Taliesin, I've known him forever. He's, no, he's been around for forever. Um, <laughs> one of the wonderful things that games 
enables is creation, together or as an individual. Much like how... <laughs> much like how it took a lot of technology to put this relic into a scanner to recreate its mouth, to make all sorts of odd noises. Ah! Uh, I, don't even, I don't even know how to put that one in there. Thanks, Liam. You're the one, you're the one that got me. Uh, <laughs> but being empowered to create, I think, is one of the most magical things about tabletop games, especially RPGs. Um, it's where you get your friends together, and out of the ether, you prepare what you can through preparation, and then, then abandon it through adaptability, and then suddenly you are just crafting something as one, and that is a series of memories that you hold on to the rest of your life. There are moments in home games, and I'm sure many of you have the same for your side, where I don't think of it like the time we were at a table and playing a game. I remember it like we were all there. You recollect it. Like, remember when I tumbled off the side and barely grabbed the edge, and you caught my arm? You looked me in the eyes and said, if you go, we both go, but none of us are going, and you pulled me up on the side, and you're like, oh my god, that was such a cool moment, thank you for that. And anybody in the other side of the room be like, where do you go on your vacations? Holy shit! <laughs> like, you know, you are... You are creating stories, but you're creating memories that are visceral and real, and that's why the bonds are so strong. That's why the, the people that you invite to these spaces uh, and engage within these spaces are, are an incredible community to behold. Um, this here are people who are filling these halls with creations as businesses, people that were inspired by this growing industry to go out there and create books, to create dice, to create terrain, uh, to create board games and experiences because this is their passion. And here at events like PAX, they can bring it here and hope that you will engage with it. So please do. But even outside of the commerce aspect of it, all of you at these game tables at this convention are creating this entire weekend. You are crafting those memories, you are finding those friends, and you'll be telling tales from this weekend years to come to certain people about what you're about to do this weekend. Like that is the empowerment of creation in ways that we don't expect. And I think that is so important. As far as creating yourself and for world building as well, this is a term that I've come to love. Sonder, which was coined by John Koenig in about 2012. The feeling one has on realizing that every other individual one sees has a life, as full and real as one's own, in which they are the central characters and others, including oneself, have secondary or insignificant roles. Everyone you meet, that person at the gas station, the person that's crossing the street, the person that's yelling at you as you accidentally step in front of their you know, shopping cart, they all have lives that are as intricate and as deep and as valued as your own. They have passions, they have wants, they have fears, they have goals. And that is a wonderful outlook for life in general, to just extend empathy and sympathy to the world around you. Um, it's also an important tool for world building and creating in your own world. When I create elements of Exandria, that is something that I try and keep in mind when I think of, you know, the simple stable hand or the, you know, lowly gong farmer. If you know what a gong farmer is, <laughs> look it up. Um, each one of these people, even if it's just an instant thought, they're more than just their job. They're more than just their uh, attempt to make money and get by. Those little thoughts help you instinctively build a more robust world that both is more immersive for you and more invested in by you but anybody else that steps in. Even the most inspired or like offhand NPC you've had to create unexpectedly, taking a moment to just write down something fun about their life outside of what they do, that's a wonderful hook that makes that character from two-dimensional to three-dimensional immediately. And I think that experience doesn't just help in life, but it's been something that I've taken with me in my form of creation, and I hope that many of you also try it out if you haven't. It's a wonderful exercise that extended in the rest of your experiences in the world. It can be very, very positive. Um, all of you are going to be doing this this weekend. I challenge you to keep Sonder in mind for every person you want to invite to a game, to interact with on the show floor, to uh, even have a, a bad experience with. You know, who, kn who knows? They might be having a bad day. You know, doesn't mean you have to be around them <laughs> then as long as you need to, but I send that a little bit of grace. Every person has their own challenges, their own joys, and I think even looking at this room, and I'm sure many of you at home that are watching online, like uh, being able to extend that sort of empathy to someone new or old is an incredible experience and allows for these experiences at the table to be more robust, long-lasting, memorable, and wonderful.
So finally, winding down this meandering ramble, in conclusion, <laughs> in conclusion, I'm a huge nerd. There you go. That's, I think, is pretty much the, the final theme there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm passionate about games, I'm passionate about community, I'm passionate about conventions fostering community, and I'm excited to be here with you all, I'm excited that you came, and uh, uh, for the rest of this panel experience, uh, let's have a little sit down and chat. Uh, some questions that the community submitted, and I'm going to bring out on stage here, if you could please welcome the wonderful Anna Prosser to have a conversation with me. Hey, Matt. This is our living room now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am, uh, I've decided my official title is uh, Arbiter of Queries today. Ooh. Yes. Arbiter of uh, Queries. These fine people and those of the internet have submitted questions for you, Matt. The first one is Alvin from Williamsburg mm -hmm. wants to know, how do you beat writer's block? How do you beat writer's block? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the, us, the audience the, says. The billion dollar question for anybody to have a true answer for. Um, I mean, it's hard to, to beat it. It's more sidestepping. Mm. There's always things that, for me at least, and I can only speak from my experience, there's always going to be blocks in certain eras. I'm not the kind of person that can beat my head against a wall until it breaks. Um, some people can do that, and I respect the hell out of that. But for me, I need to change my atmosphere. If I sit there and stare at a blank screen, I'll, I'll crumble. So I will remove myself from my office. I'll remove myself from the space of anxiety and take a walk. I'll take a hike. I'll, uh, music is a great way to take inspiration. Uh, I have many soundtracks that are different moods and genres, and I'll just walk with headphones in and just listen and try not to think on what I'm trying to do and just let my mind wander where it wants. And the music is a great way to kind of guide it on paths you weren't expecting. Um, and walking to places you're unfamiliar with safely, places that are safe, <laughs> um, and with a friend is also great too. Um, but uh, just removing myself from the place of anxiety really helps kind of guide that forward. Um, also, consuming other media. Mm. Um, if you're trying to do something that is a particular type of story or a particular type of genre or a particular type of, of uh, writing experience, consuming things that aren't like what you're doing but completely far removed. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like... I mean, I'll say it. I'm not a fan of, of reality TV, but every now and then, me and Marisha will sit down with some Love is Blind and just watch the worst of humanity uh, and find the weirdest bits of inspiration from some of these interactions mm -hmm. and some of these machinations that happen in these shows. So, like, you never know where you get inspiration, but as I'm learning quickly, as my life gets filled with responsibility progressively, um, there's only so much you can pour out of your cup unless you're filling it. And mm -hmm. so the writer's block usually comes from you being on close to empty, mm -hmm. and you have to refill. And that comes to just watching, watching some shows, watching some of your favorite shows, watching shows that your friends recommend that you've never seen, watching something that you think that would be, I would never watch this, you know, at mm -hmm. all. But give it a shot and step outside of your comfort zone. You'd, you'd really be taken aback at, one, the things you engage with once you kind of let yourself step in for a bit and kind of wade mm -hmm. past the awkwardness of, I don't think this is for me, and then be like, oh no, this is actually pretty cool. Um, so th those, those are things that work for me usually, mm -hmm. uh, and I hope they work for some of you as well. <laughs> Follow-up question on that, because I think all of us love finding inspiration in things like the games we watch, the movies we watch, shows and things. How do you recommend someone takes inspiration when they might be worried about just carbon copying something? It's a tough line. Um, part of it would be asking other people, mm. you know, hey, is this too close? <laughs> 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 having, having somebody who isn't a yes you know, person who can... Uh, who you trust, a friend who can be blunt and be like, ah, that's pretty close. <laughs> you know, it also helps. Outside perspective is great. Um, also, trying to, trying to find inspiration and really find the, the, the nugget that excites you. Mm -hmm. Is it because of the overall story or is it a certain facet of that story? And how can you take that and apply that to things that are radically different mm -hmm. um, and take it in a different direction? Um, it's, it's a tough balance. I mean, when you really break it down, nothing is new. Everything is iterative. Human culture has been telling stories since it could tell. And uh, especially with the growth of media and accessibility of stories over the past hundred years, um, it's, it's hard for anything to be truly unique. I'm not saying it's impossible, but everything usually is some sort of iterative combination of things that have come before, whether intentional or not. Sometimes it's just happenstance. You know, great minds think alike sort of a scenario. So uh, you have to be ready for that possibility 
that even a unique idea to you may have been done by somebody else in a certain way, and that's okay as long as you acknowledge um, and not, you know, hide yourself under plagiarism. Um, but, being, but being conscious of that is very important, and I think even the fact that you're thinking about it is a good sign, but asking for outside uh, uh, perspective on it, doing your research online, you know, Google can be your friend if you have a really cool idea for something and you want to move forward with it to like put in a few keywords and see if other people have already done extensive works in a similar realm. And if they have, don't abandon it, mm -hmm. but see what things are too similar, remove those, and maybe step outside, take a walk, watch an old Perry Mason episode and see oh if something gosh. from there yes. takes it in a different direction that's wholly unique, you know? That is the first time someone has mentioned Perry Mason in a panel like this, and I'm just... <laughs> Blessed. I used to watch it before school in middle yes. school. Oh. It would come out at like 5, 36 in the morning. Wins every time. Yeah. It's genius. All right. Uh, <laughs> Albert from Connecticut wants to know, what is your favorite character that you've voiced in your entire life? Entire life, Matt. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <sighs> if that's too hard, what's the first one that comes to mind? It's tough. Oh, the, first, the first one that comes to mind for many reasons, uh, is probably going to be Vincent Valentine on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Um, one, because it's a character that I adore in a game that formed a, a lot of me as a teenager. Final Fantasy VII was a very, very uh, kind of world-shattering game when it came out. Though I will say six, I think, has the better story for my tastes. I think seven as an overall presentational package was incredible. And so being able to step into that role uh, is, is wonderful in its own right, but also my dear friend Steve Bloom uh, originated the character many years ago, and so it's also like pa you know, having the mm -hmm. torch passed to me from somebody that I deeply love and respect and kind of make it my own with his mm -hmm. blessing has been really, really cool. So I, I'm, I'm really excited for that. Do you want to do a line for the people? <laughs> <laughs> Cloud, how do you want to do this? <laughs> That's my little emo vampire boy. <laughs> the people are pleased. <laughs> X-Teen from New York City asks, how do you go about creating a convincingly evil yet unsympathetic character? I'm assuming because you are not a convincingly evil and unsympathetic character. How do you go about creating one? I hope so. Tell me if it's otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, when, when creating a character, it, especially a, a, a prominent character in a story or a campaign, uh, to the same point of Sonder from earlier, like you have to really consider how they got there, um, why they believe the things they believe. Um, strong convictions really drive a person of a, an, an amoral standpoint, given a particular standpoint uh, in a story. Um, and convincingly is that kind, somebody who that conviction is the strongest thing to them, uh, is, can make a very strong villain. Their sympathy across the board for a lot of, of villainous characters if circumstances in the world have made them what they are and they accepted those circumstances, they are then lashing out because of it or they've allowed it to change them in ways when they had the option to instead uh, go a path of um, support or a mm. path of, of growth and healing. Um, but there's also narcissists, and there are manipulators, and there are people that, are, that have elements of sociopathy in the world. I know because I've met them uh, in <laughs> Hollywood. Weird, huh? Um, you know, I've, I've had people in, in, in my world in the past that, you know, not close friends, but, but people around me that I, I got to know and began to see very dark sides of them. And, there, is, there are facets of, of especially that cross-section of, of sociopathy and, and narcissism is a very dangerous combination. But I think that truly can drive a villain that hasn't been, there can be aspects of how the world affected them, but uh, it's very hard to change, to course correct somebody's beliefs and convictions when they only believe that they have an idea of what's right in the world and nobody, nobody matters except for mm. them. That is a terrifying mindset. And oddly, not unfamiliar in a lot of large-scale world politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
When you go about writing or acting as one of these characters, what is it like slipping in and out of kind of inhabiting that character? And it's how do you do, Yeah, how do you do it? It's horrifying. I had a particular NPC in our second critical role campaign named Trent Ikathon. The, yeah, people who don't know. Um, who, 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 was, who was very much a definition of that, a, a, a sociopathic narcissist, um, and is very deeply steeped in the a history of trauma in one of our player characters' backstories. And I loved creating the character because he, to the point of this question, is a character that you love to hate. Mm -hmm. um, but then stepping into that role and having to kind of put myself in the mindset of those values, in the mindset of those goals, and, and react appropriately to players' interactions and, and, and you know, arguments, uh, it's a unique acting challenge, or a good debate challenge. For me, it was ever in like debate club, which I wasn't, but Marisha's really good at it. I don't argue with her for many reasons. Um, uh, it's a good exercise, but it, if, if you're a healthy person, <laughs> it also helps. It feels good to step out of that and feel gross, yeah. because you can see that separation between how you value the world and how they do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a fun exercise, and it's a fun story element to bring up to your players to give them someone to really rally against. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels a little gross, and, uh, and <laughs> yeah. it should. If it doesn't, <laughs> talk to your therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Ambrose from South Jersey asks, how much of a dream come true was it to play Minsk in Baldur's Gate 3? Oh, my goodness. So Baldur's Gate, uh, that was my favorite series of video games, you know, since I played the first uh, 98. Like, I, I loved those games. I played through so many playthroughs. Um, and Minsk was my favorite character. Jim Cummings did such a wonderful job establishing this character. Uh, all of my alert sounds on my computer for years were all different Minsk quotes. Really? So, like, I, I've been suffused <laughs> in the character. And so when I had the opportunity to take that torch again, it, it was huge brack of nerves auditioning for it, much like Vincent was. And then when I accepted it, it was like, oh no, oh no. Okay, now I, I got to do this now. Uh, <laughs> oh man. Uh, and here's the thing. Vincent is a character uh, persona that is a very uh, smooth fit for me. I, I've, I've played similar type characters and it can make it unique and tweak it and have all this you know, history with kind of finding his subtle dynamics and, and exploring the breadth of his internal character through this and the next game. Um, Minsk is such a wild, specific persona, <laughs> one that I know very well and hold dear, but also know there's a lot of expectation behind it. So yeah. I, it was an extreme honor and a massive source of anxiety. <laughs> um, and talking with Larian, it was great because uh, not trying to do a direct impression, you know, right. uh, but to take enough homage to what Jim had put before and then make the rest of it my own, but still feel true to Minsk as we all, both the folks at Larry and myself and hopefully the community feel, uh, was a really fun challenge and exercise. And I've, I've loved every moment of it. There's something about, you know, the opposite end of stepping into a terrible villain and feeling icky, <laughs> stepping in and out of Minsk, you're like, that was great. <laughs> that I was am. so fun. Yeah, yeah. No, it's for everyone. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I'm curious because I think a lot of people would probably be surprised to know that you felt nervous or anxious about that as the accomplished voice actor and, and persona that you are. So I'm curious, when you do feel those kinds of nerves and anxiety, how do you combat them? That's a good question. <laughs> um, they don't go away. <laughs> Not for me, at least. Anyway. Before every session we do for Critical Role, I get nervous for about 30 minutes leading up to it. Backstage before this, I was a wreck. You know, like, I, the, the nerves never go away. For me, it's pushing through it. Mm -hmm because there is that instinct to just turn and run. Mm -hmm. And there were times in my life where I did, and I regretted them immensely. And it, for me, it's, it's accepting the, hum the humanity of trusting that people can see the nerves and identify with that, then judge me for it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Totally. Um, you know, like, thank you. It's a fear of failure and embarrassment is one of the large things that drives those sort of nerves. And that's very human. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but if you're in a space with like-minded people, um, not always the case, but when you are, uh, just acknowledging and, and, and embracing the fact that people are rooting for you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Like for, for, for auditions. Yeah. I'm nervous for auditions, but people aren't sitting there going like, all right, 
show me how bad you are so I can throw you into the wind. Like, right. they're, most casting directors want you to succeed because they're on a schedule to try and <laughs> fill out their casting list the producers are breathing down their neck on, and they want you to do, to do great so that you make them look great so the game does great. Like, so everyone is cheering everyone else on and just trying to find the right fit. And if you aren't the right fit, that's okay too. It doesn't mean you're bad. It just means mm -hmm. the tapestry of all the casting didn't work out. So like, all these different things come together to try and help you understand that nerves are part of the experience, but you still have to take that shot. And what little bits peek through, people will still see. Like, even mm -hmm. when I was nervous for Thundercats, they were like, they could, they could hear it and hope that as I grew more comfortable, it would eventually be okay, and it was. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, the best answer is I'm still figuring it out. Uh, <laughs> and a lot, of it, a lot of it is just pushing through regardless. I love what you said about thinking about other people wanting you to succeed, too. Someone recently told me that the opposite of anxiety is trust. And I think that's kind of beautiful. Like, I like that. I feel like you have a really beautiful relationship with the people that are watching you. You feel like you trust them a little bit more, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that also, you know, spaces like this are that. You know, I, I feel comfortable. If this was a group of strangers and businessmen, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'd be a leaf on the floor right now. Suits. But like, but, but the, the, this feels different because you're my community. They're like, I, I care about this and you all care about this so much. So uh, that helps me get through the nerves. Speaking of other games, Frisky from Ohio wants to know, what non-D&D games do you find the most joy in? Ooh, in general? Well, I mean, as far as like tabletop games, Stardew Valley and Kingdom Death Monster. Uh, Kingdom Death Monster in particular was an obsession of mine over the pandemic, partially because it's just this terrifying kind of boutique horror game my friend Tom introduced to me, and the minis are horrifying. <laughs> uh, and, and I missed painting. Mini painting for me was a very zen experience. And uh, as the world grows more anxious, especially mid-pandemic, I, I needed something to kind of center myself. And so this is a game that I can play with my wife. Uh, it was horrifying and, and <laughs> dark as it was, but that's very much our aesthetic too and our joy. Yeah. Um, but also it gave me a lot of things to paint uh, and kind of bring to life through, through my art. And that, that was something that I really fell in love with. Um, so that's been an, a, a great joy. Um, I, I mean, I, I just love, I love board games that you don't have to prepare. Mm. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as an eternal GM, it's nice to just jump in. And we also, we just finally got our copy of Return to Dark Tower, which is so much fun. I'm playing that at home. Um, and uh, other small RPGs. I mean, things we're developing at Darrington, we get to test all the time. And so that's been a lot of fun too. Uh, didn't mean that'd be a plug, but just like we are spending a lot of time doing that, so um, yeah, I, I, I would wish I had more time to play more games. Yeah. There's so many wonderful ones out there, and I get so many ones recommended to me. There's a great convention called Big Bad Con mm. that I've been to a number of years. That is a wonderful event that uplifts incredible creators in the space uh, of marginalized backgrounds, communities, and it's it's so many emerging game design that comes out of that is brilliant. And so that is an opportunity for me to engage in a lot of wonderful, unique, independent games too. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, but I hope to have more time to do more in the future. <laughs> Don't we all, really? I know, honestly. I know. <laughs> Being an adult sometimes sucks. Ugh. <laughs> a lot of times. Mike, <laughs> <laughs> Mike from Newark asks, as a GM, have you ever given an item or ability to a player and instantly regretted it? <laughs> or... Vax, Boots of Haste, campaign <laughs> one. I didn't even have to finish the question. Tell us about Boots of Haste. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing, here's the thing. Because uh, we were playing in Pathfinder at home, and then when we, we jumped over to streaming, we had eight players at the time, and Pathfinder was not, the first edition was not conducive to eight players and expediency in combat, especially in the mid to higher levels. And at the time for the edition to come out, and it, it, was, it was more of a tool set that worked for what we were going into. Um, so when we trif went over to fifth edition, I had to transition a lot of the items that I'd given them in Pathfinder over without fully understanding a lot of the limitations and boundaries of 5e as intended. Um, like concentration spells on spells you can cast on items like haste are important to have still be just spell cast the concentration, not just free haste <laughs> all the time, um, especially given to a rogue who can then uh, double dash and then bonus action dash, double movement speed and become like a sound barrier breaking bullet <laughs> rogue. Um, but but it was my fault. <laughs> I accepted it, and it just meant I had to come up with more creative ways to destroy him. <laughs> and I kind of did. Twice. <laughs> so 
Can't outrun the centigrade boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, Liam. <laughs> the satisfaction in your eyes is just beautiful. Oh, every gym out there knows it. Yeah. We're all like, yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Blompus from Blompsburg asks, can you share a memorable interaction or story from a fan that highlights the impact of your work on their life? Oh, my goodness. Um, too, too many. Uh, that, that's one of the most wonderful things about what's grown out of Critical Role, is being able to engage with the community and kind of see where us just fooling around in the camera has had a, a positive impact. Like, you know, the Critical Role Foundation and then seeing all of these people take this positivity and run with it is, is incredible. Now that we're kind of getting back to doing conventions and getting to re-engage with the community, it's wonderful to talk to critters face to face again and like share stories. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's some stories that are very emotionally involved, people who've had loss in their life and family, but the story kept them going. People that themselves were having, having a hard time finding a reason to keep going themselves, mm. but having the next episode, the next part of the story unfold week after week was what kept them coming back until eventually they got to a better place in their life. Those are, those are always a lot, but, but incredible, because you never know the impact that your joy will give to somebody else. And that mm. goes for all of you playing games this weekend too. There will be people that will walk up to your tables who might be having a hard time and you inviting them in with a smile and teaching them the rules and inviting them to create in this space with you all and have fun might be something that keeps them going a little longer until they find footing again. Mm. And so th those moments are very important to me and a perspective that uh, makes me feel like whatever this is we've built <laughs> mm -hmm. is so much more important than any of us could have expected and why we guard it so fiercely. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put that in my pocket. You never know the joy you, or the impact your joy will have on someone else's life. That's really profound. Cool. Yeah, good job. <laughs> 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 All right, anyway, Phil wants to know from Pittsburgh, what's your favorite dinosaur? That's a valid question. I, that's an ankylosaur, man. It doesn't get enough love and it's just this squat little tank that's like, come at me, bro, I dare you. Like, everyone else has got some serious kind of openings. They're fast, but like, they, they got, I don't know, Ankylosaur feels like the min-maxer of dinosaurs in a lot of ways, and I, <laughs> I respect the hell out of that. Like, you go, little munchkin, you go. <laughs> <laughs> min-maxer. All right, um, this one is from the sound of an eagle's cry as it soars on the hunt. From... Man, that must have been rough at roll call in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From that place where dreams meet hope in the far, far south. Oh, it's still going. Okay, yes. sorry. Okay. Mm. They ask, the internet's best friend and your good buddy Sam Regal is well known for his continual pranking of you. Do you have a favorite gag of his? This is a great prank. Uh, so, par part of us as a, as a group of friends, especially as things get got busy with Critical Role, we have to make sure that we spend time together as friends, you know, outside of the table. Every time we record a session, that, that's like our wonderful sacred time, but also outside of that. So like, we'll get dinner together. We'll, if we can try and carve out a weekend, we'll all go on a trip together. And there was one uh, trip where we all took to this like little like cabin ranch thing to just kind of get away. They, kid, the families brought their kids and we like did some horseback riding and it was, it was this sweet little kind of just catch up experience. And so we were out there for a number of days in the middle of this kind of like wooded uh, ranch area in Colorado. And Liam, every morning, just kept waking up to these little, like, Blair Witch, <laughs> like, wooden trinkets that were left right outside of his door. And he's like, what the hell is this? And he's like, it's like there, did anybody else get this? So like, no, why? <laughs> and every, every day, a different one would show up, and, like, it started incorporating, like, bones and things. And, and Liam kept trying. He's like, I know it's Sam Regal. So he kept keeping like on Sam's ass to a way where there was no way he could have done it and then there would still be one. <laughs> and he's like, okay, what's going on? He started freaking out. Uh, Sam and his wife, Q, <laughs> were collaborating to mess with Liam the entire trip. <laughs> and the jiggle was only up at the very end of the trip, but it was wonderful to watch Liam like slowly unravel. <laughs> I, I respect that immensely. <laughs> That's amazing. The, the long work for that one. Oh yeah. Incredible. 
All right, this is the last fan submitted question. Okay. From Keir, um, from Connecticut. They want to know, asking as a Corgi owner, mm -hmm. if you based an NPC on Omar, what would their personality be and what might their voice sound like? Everyone has a voice for their dog. You can't pretend oh, you Oh, man. Omar, Omar almost sounds like a lighter Pumat. He's, he's like, he's a more like, like, give me, give me attention. <laughs> Why are you working? <laughs> Come on, pet me. <laughs> um, he's, I mean, he's, but he's also like a frontline leader. That, that dog doesn't give a shit about coyotes. He's just like, if that, someone shows up on your yard, he's like, you, get out of my house! And just right, we're like, no, no, they'll eat you! <laughs> and the coyotes are like, geez, fine, we'll leave. And they kind of wander off. Uh, he, he's, he's so ballsy, he doesn't understand how small he is, but he's very dense. So I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd, probably, I'd probably make him like, like, a, like a barbarian paladin multi-class, because he's frontline, he thinks he's protective, but he's, he's also like dumb stat intelligence a little bit. Not to say, no, I'd say wisdom. Because Omar's very smart. I wouldn't say he's very wise. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, really so we'd definitely be kind of like that, uh, don't worry, I got this, boys. Get behind me. I'm going to run off that cliff. <laughs> That's very much kind of the vibe. <laughs> it's got the rage, too, for the oh, yeah. barbarian. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, what, no. If it's paladin multiclass, what would Omar's deity be? Oh, oh uh, that would probably be the storm lord <laughs> he's like challenge come on come at me come at me every other dog he meets he's like nervous at first no matter the size and then he's like hey you're gonna you're gonna wrestle <laughs> we're gonna do this come on come on come at me come at me like he just kind of has that energy so yeah probably storm lord okay great i want to <laughs> see this character in a campaign sometime <laughs> i'll see what i can do <laughs> That is our last fan submitted question, but uh, we're going into PAX Unplugged 2023. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for everyone as they enjoy this weekend? Um, my biggest advice would be to make friends with someone new, many people new. Uh, you know, you have your old friends, the people you know, the people you game with, but leave some space to make some new ones. Uh, leave space at your table for, for people to come and, and join, and leave space to engage with a table in a game that you otherwise haven't had the experience with. So just be open to new experiences and new people. That'd be my biggest advice for the weekend. Thank you. Let's hear it for Matt Mercer. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. All right, everyone, have a great PAX Unplugged. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>